Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 162, featuring part two of my interview with Mr. Graham Devine. In this part of the interview, we zero in on his greatest achievement, The Seventh Guest, a best-selling adventure game that some people say helped launch the CD-ROM itself as a storage technology. A lot of great stuff in this interview, especially for you fans of adventure games and the CDI. So without further ado, here is Mr. Graham Devine. So this is the, we're getting into the early 1990s, and of course we're on the eve of this breakthrough uh, hit for you, right? So, but, you know, I'm thinking of early 90s, the CD-ROM technology is still very, very new, right? Sort of a lot of prototypes and everything. So how was it sort of, how were the, was the idea already incubating to make this, uh, to make the seventh guest? You know, how did you get there? Um, seventh guest was an interesting game to arrive at because there was a technological CDI that uh, Philips was was uh, promoting that was getting to be pretty popular um, in terms of them getting developers. But um, so we would go to conferences like Multimedia and CD-ROM, and um, um, we were at one conference in New York City, and this is when when Rob and I really started to talk. Uh, we really started to get on because we're sitting on an airplane together, we're in airports together, we're in taxis together, we're going to conference together. We went to this conference about multimedia, and every single presentation was on, you know, text search algorithms and speeding things up to, uh, to find encyclopedias. And none of it was to do with multimedia. There was no pictures. There was no video. There was no nothing. And to us, you know, CD-ROM meant video. It meant, you know, um, interaction. It meant a, a chance to not have a floppy disk. And both of us at the time were really, really, really into, um, um, it, into the TV show Twin Peaks. And we were both wanting to go make a Twin Peaks game, and that was, uh, and yeah, you know, have all the David Lynch items into it. All the uh, every week we were having huge discussions on what Twin Peaks meant, and it was we were fascinated by it. And um, Mastertronic at the time had uh, had the license to a game called Clue, so we were thinking, you know, let's use the Clue license but make Twin Peaks with it, so it's kind of a Twin Peaks Clue. And so we're at the airport in New York City, and it's, it's literally one of those times when we have a napkin. It's, you know, like you hear those napkin stories up on the back of a napkin. We have a napkin that says the words guest on it and uh, um, Twin Peaks and Clue. And uh, that, that's when we started to trace things out. So we started to get the, you know, the very first ideas to go make Seventh Guest. So you actually have this napkin still? No. <laughs> Framed up in a... No. <laughs> it got tossed. We remade the napkin for the um, for the strategy guide. I don't think it was the original napkin. Well, were you worried at the time that you know the CD-ROMs hadn't really been widely adopted yet, and that you know there was a potential that this just nobody would be able to play it because they didn't have the, the tech? Oh yeah, that was. Um, I mean, we went back and we worked hard on a game design for CD-ROM game, and um, no one had the technology. No one could even burn CD-ROMs at the time. Burners weren't available yet. Um, and it was, when we took it to Martin, um, to Martin Alpha, he was like, wow, th this is a fantastic game design. Let's go to lunch. And he took us to lunch and, you know, he, he's like, first of all, I've got to tell you, this is a fantastic game design. I think it's going to be breakthrough, but I'm going to have to fire you both. Um, and he, <laughs> fire you. Um, uh, and he's like, but I'll do one thing. I'll, um, you guys are just not getting on, on you know, on the uh, on the train here to go, you know go make cartridges and uh, cartridges is the future of gaming and 8-bit Nintendo is the future of gaming. The CD-ROM thing is not going to take off, but because I love you both, uh, I'll give you a contract to go make this game uh, and you can make the floppy disk version of it. And as long as there's a floppy disk version of it, we will make the CD-ROM version too, and we will put this out as the as the interactive edge product to show that we're invested in interactive technology, things like CD-ROM, and that we have a cutting edge part of our company. Um, so he fired us and at the same time gave us a contract to go set up a company and uh, actually start making Seventh Guest. So this is one of the first games, maybe it's the, the first game, that really used a lot of uh, live action uh, video clips with real actors and, and the pre-rendered uh, 3D graphics and everything. So you must have just been inventing a lot of this stuff, you know, kind of just on the spot, right? Yeah, well, at first we were, um, we were up in Oregon and there was the house that, that we based Southern Guest on was right next to us and we were going to use photography to just show everything. Um, so we went into the house and uh, 
And we got permission to go take pictures of it. And it's dressed for uh, Christmas uh, constantly throughout the year. Uh, and the inside of the house is extremely cramped. I mean, the rooms are tiny. So we were like, well, that won't work. <laughs> um, like, huh. So then we came across the idea of using still renders and, um, um, and somehow managed to manipulate still renders. And uh, um, Robert Stein, the artist, made an, um, an animation in, of really low res of just going up the stairs in the mansion, uh, you know, just very low resolution and, and wireframe. And we were like, oh, my God. And um, Rob and, uh, and, and Rob were like, well, that's impossible. And if you remember, <laughs> it was the impossible is just a little bit longer. So it, it was like, we're doing that. We are, we are going to make a full motion video game and we are going to make it one seamless camera shot and we are going to do it in, in SVGA on, on the PC and it is going to look wonderful. And thankfully, uh, they, they bought into my let's do that impossible thing and uh, supported me as I developed the technology and made that uh, all the file compressors and everything you know, that we had to, to actually make for some guests. It turns out the technology was actually the easy part. It was, uh, you know, things like networks and backend storage and backups and um, hard drives were, you know, the big thing to get because, um, you know, we were poor. We only had to make this game. We couldn't even afford a five gigabyte hard drive. So it was, you know, tough. So is that how you became the father of file compression? Oh. Uh, out of necessity. I don't know if that comes from there. Back at, 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 um, back at Mastertronic, I used to get, um, um, they would put out these compendium games for like the Commodore 64 and for um, uh, the, the, the PC and stuff. And um, Martin would come to me and say, hey, I got these on two floppy disks. If you can put these onto one floppy disk, I'll give you a thousand dollars, and so I would sit and I, I would sit and learn how to compress the BIOS and compress um, the, the assets down and compress sec disks, and um, so that I could come up with a menu that would uh, let you load both games, and they could be on one floppy disk, which would save a dollar per copy sold, and I would get my thousand dollar bonus. Um, so when it came to video compression, I was already learning compression, but video compression is very different than file compression. Um, so a lot of the video compression work was about what the eye can't see and can see. I mean, the eye is very good at seeing luminosity, but it's very bad at seeing color. So you can compress the heck out of color. Um, if anything to do with how dark or light something is, that you have to be much more careful about. And I, I guess I just you know, look at that, and it, it's it's it, it's just a problem. Did you uh, work with the actors on The Seventh Guest? Did you uh, work on the filming? And yeah, this must have seemed a bit strange, right? It was. We were, uh, we made the script, Matthew Costello made the script up for Seventh Guest. And um, we, we had no idea how to, make a, how to make anything like this. So we contacted the Southern Oregon Theater Association or something. And, um, and Deborah Mason, who plays the part of Martine Burden in Seventh Guest, was... Uh, was our contact there and, and Deborah's like, oh, we can do this. Um, we'll just set up a, in this abandoned office in, in Medford and we'll film this in two days. And we can do this for, you know, like $15,000 or whatever. And, uh, so for two days we sat in scripts above Medford, Oregon, and um, we made that thing for $15,000 and Deborah Mason gave us a bunch of super video uh, cassettes that we then digitized and found out we had to put... Uh, or around everything, and um, yeah, we we fell in we fell into luck that way. We fell into luck by finding Deborah. So the actors weren't uh, put off in any way by you know the fact that this was a game instead of a, a TV show or a movie. No, they had no idea. I mean, they had you know the blue screen was literally. I mean, we were all you know we bought the blue screen at. Uh, some art shop, and it was turned out it was purple, and we, you know, it, it wasn't like they knew they were going into this this super expensive production because we're sitting there with cokes and a script and uh, and a VHS camera. <laughs> it was to them, it was theatre. So when you look at some of the, the acting, it's very pantomime. It's very theatre. It, it, it's not serious. It's um, you know, to them, it was. Uh, uh, I'm sure if you talk to them now, it's all about the art, but it's. Uh, 
Um, back then, it was just a bunch of people in, in, a, in an office trying to do something cool. I think that's you know part of the charm of the game. I actually have a comment here from a viewer who wants to know, uh, what was it like to develop an FMV game knowing that the press would be out for blood? <laughs> well, the press, I don't know. In, it's weird because you get the review say, oh, it's an FMV game. FMV games are dead. And then you sell three million copies. And, you know, FMV games were not dead. It's, it was a popular game that people loved. And uh, um, I really don't think the, the press were ever out to really you know, for blood. I, I, I think other developers were. I remember going to CES and, um, and Roberta Williams was, uh, you know, in looking at, uh, at Seventh Guest at CES and she was like, oh, do you mind if I bring some of my developers back in to see this? And like, no, go ahead. And so she comes back with her program and she's like, look, this is possible. I told you this is possible. And um, I remember Chris Crawford at the, at the time of CES came to see it too, and on the way back on the airplane, he he, he accused me of um, of of staging the demo, and that the, the seventh guess was actually impossible, and there was no way that a CD-ROM at 150k a second could do video like that. And so, I, the biggest memory I have is not of the press, um, except for the one Computer Gaming World review, but. Um, um, it's of the other developers telling me the game was impossible, and also of Roberta Williams and you know her wanting to have some of the guests but not having some of the guests. I don't know if I mentioned that viewer's name, Pulver Congen. Uh, so what did you? Uh, you know, you mentioned Roberta Williams. So I assume that you'd played all the King's Quest and yeah, all, all the Sierra stuff. Did you? Uh, I mean, were you inspired deeply by that? I think by this. I love the Space Quest games more than anything. Um, that was my, that was my favorite series. I actually went out to Sierra. I always got a job with them uh, right before I started Trial of Bite. Um, we had I pitched Seventh Guest, and we were waiting to hear from Martin. And um, but I wasn't interested in the cartridge thing because I'd almost killed myself on spot. And so I went out to Sierra and talked to talked to Ken and, and Roberta, and um, they offered me a job. And I'm like, cool, I accept. Just send me the letter. Um, and so I went back to California and um, um, then had the conversation with Martin to go, he fired me, sent me up with the contract. So we're about to move to Oregon to go start Trilobite when the phone rings and it's, it's Ken Williams. He's like, your desk is here. Why are you not sitting at your desk? Um, and I'm like, well, you never sent a letter confirming that I had a job. It's like, what? So he hangs up, calls, he calls back 10 minutes later, he goes, what will it take to get you sitting at your desk tomorrow? <laughs> Nothing. I'm going to start in my own company. Um, so we knew each other, and um, we always knew each other. And it's, um, I think a, a lot of those games are still fantastic. Gabriel Knights and King's Quest and Space Quest. I, I, the, you know, the, the thought they put into those games back then. And uh, you know, I, I, I'm glad to see some of them coming back on Kickstarter. Well, just you know, to come back to the seventh guest. I I just would have, I would have loved to have been in your shoes, you know, when this game uh, was released. I mean, Bill Gates, you got Bill Gates himself saying that it's, quote, the new standard in interactive entertainment. You know, this thing, I don't know how many millions of copies this thing, this thing. So, I mean, were you anticipating this uh, level of success or were you surprised? I mean, it's kind of put me in your, in the, in your mindset at the time. Uh, we were two guys in Southern Oregon expecting to fail, um, uh, but we were tenacious, and we had no idea how well this game was going to do. Um, it was, we had none. I mean, uh, we, we, in kind of at the CES thing, we knew that um, we had, it was going to be something special because it generated so much buzz at CES. And I remember sitting on the airplane coming home going, bloody hell, now we've got to finish it. Um, and but when the game came out and it started to fly off the shelves at ninety nine dollars in that big book thing, and um, we started to be on the front cover of magazines and the press started to come at us, it was very shocking, very surprising. Um, we didn't expect that at all. There was no expectation of success, anything to do with the seventh guest. It was all a surprise. So did you run out and buy a Ferrari, or, or what'd you do? No, um, we we put the we. I've never owned a, a nice car. Somehow I've managed to always put the money into my company. Uh, we made a lovely hour and almost killed ourselves. That, that's, that's what we did. Well, the, you know, the setup of the game, you know, the actual gameplay, I think I read it has 21 puzzles. 
You know, this is a format I've seen, you know, copied in, you know, again and again. It seems to be that, you know, to set up a whole uh, genre. Uh, but, you know, we were also talking earlier about how you like to put story, you know, in the games. And I noticed this was some of the criticism, not just of uh, Seventh Guest, but all adventure games. You know, how do you, uh, you know, mix the story with the puzzles where the puzzles don't interfere with the story and the you know, stories don't interfere with the puzzles, you know. Uh, so you have any thoughts on that, sort of how you uh, combine uh, good stories with good puzzles and have it work as a game? I, my thoughts on that are I probably disagree with most of the computer game industry, and this is where they all get their guns out and shoot me again. I, I like tell stories and I like to tell stories on my terms and I, like, I think people like to hear stories on other people's terms. So interactive adventures, where I, the AI responds to you and you do a game and it's, it, it kind of figures things out. Um, those one day I think will be absolutely fantastic but in the meanwhile I'm going to continue to tell stories my way and um, I'm as long as someone likes it, I'm okay with that. But um, I've always loved the story in the games, and I, I always come at a game from a story point of view. Um, the very first thing I did on Halo was uh, uh, to send out you know, emails to the team from uh, publishing the, the ship's newspaper, the, the, you know, the Spirit, uh, and um, I would send out you know, reports of the, uh, from the, the medical logs from the ship as crew were coming in of the, of the radioactive burns and I did the same on 11th hour I would send out stories that were nothing to do with the you know with the game or nothing but said in that universe so that the team would kind of get to know the story surrounding staff and um, I, I, I think any game that you can create a world that everyone believes in and you can go make a game in it um, the game benefits from that, and if you can add a story to it and tell a story within that world, then the game benefits from that too. And, to the, and if you can actually add story elements that then the player will actually get to experience, then I love doing that, and that's 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 really my passion in, in making games. And it's uh, it, it's interesting because it's it, when you go to GDC, it's the, you know the big argument is always you know this is exactly the wrong way to tell you know to make games. This is you should be in the movie business. It's um, I'm I'm crap at making movies, so <laughs> I'll just stick to this. Well, Graham, you seem to be a really great storyteller. I mean, the the seventh guest story I think is you know would have been great as a movie, or I, I keep imagining Vincent Price for some reason, or maybe St <laughs> Stephen King. Uh, you know, with the with the dolls and the infections, and, and you know, it's a really kind of scary uh, story if you sit, you know if you think about it, or you play the game. I mean, how did you come up with this? Uh, the original story was actually um, like a two-page thing that I just came up with, um, and it was about Henry Steeple was the original name for staff and seven people visiting, um, and Matthew Costello was the author who we went to actually turned the name into staff and came up with the backstories of each of the characters. Um, and actually filled out the life in there. Um, and so that was actually a great collaboration at the time of uh, you know, my initial two pager just became, you know, Matthew's creation. So he, he should really get the credit for filling out the, uh, uh, the characters there and, uh, and completing it. Um, I'm just the guy who started the, uh, uh, started the story ball rolling on that one. One of my favorite parts of the game is the is Stoff. I think everybody likes you know likes him, and the only way he kind of mocks you as you're playing. And, and what a great uh, great addition! Who, who, whose idea was was that? Well, you can imagine that we were working a lot of hours on this game, uh, <laughs> more or less round the clock crunching for nine months. We had a lot of audio of Staff um, because we'd had some ideas on uh, him commenting on the adventure puzzles and we'd done things with, and so we had all these audio clips. So as we're busy working the game, we would sit and tune it and, uh, you, know, it, you know, things like in the maze and in, you know, through the kitchen and, you know, like, are we there yet? Feeling lonely, you know. <laughs> we would sit and just add those and add those and add those until it became almost annoying. But Each it was, um, I, I love anything to do with adding, you know, I, I don't want to go through a maze and feel that it's just a computer maze that I should just click on exit. I want to feel that someone's chasing me. I want to feel that someone's after me and that someone's watching. Um, you know, th that is, I think, a lot of the creep out factor of some of the guests is that you don't know what will click will actually make a noise. 
And a lot of people wrote saying, you know, I couldn't believe that I got to the top of the stairs and I clicked on the, on the painting and the face came out or the hands came out. And like, it, it, that scared me off, off my desk. Um, and, you know, I went into the, into the maze and the first time the staff said, you know, you know, cursed at me was, uh, you know, was that, was actually scary. And I jumped, um, those little moments are fantastic moments in gaming that people will, they always tell you and people still come up to me now and say seventh guest and that they remember the, the, the hands coming out of the picture. And anytime you can create a moment like that in a game, I jump at that. When you were making this this game, did you imagine yourself as just making a game, or were you thinking uh, this is a new form, you know, completely new uh, form of entertainment that we're working with here? We were way too tired to think that lofty. <laughs> we were uh, um, we, we mostly cursed our CD ROM burner and yelled out the window constantly when we had bad renders, and uh, there was never a point where we were we, we were never not busy enough to sit back and sit, say. Oh my God, we're making something special. Um, I, those nine months were just crammed. I think the only break we had was um, maybe towards the end of the project was uh, um, Rob and I would still watch horror movies together constantly. And we watched The Shining um, and we watched The Shining and then we watched it again and then we watched it again and we watched it maybe three times in a row. And um, at that point, I think we realized that we hadn't made The Shining you know, because it's impossible to go and make The Shining, but we'd made something that was kind of, you know, House on a Haunted Hill, The Shining, um, in terms of a CD-ROM game. And we started to have a conversation about where that would go from there and what would happen next. Um, but we still didn't think we'd actually made it because, you know, now we'd made Seventh Guest, we had the idea to go make the next big thing. Um, Seventh Guest turned out it was the next big thing. There's not an old manual typewriter sitting around somewhere with all work and no play makes a grandma dull boy, is there? Yes, there are many, many. <laughs> Crunching on a game is interesting. Well, you've worked uh, with George Sanger, a.k.a. the Fat Man. You know, I'm just kind of wondering, what, what was it like working with him? He's kind of <laughs> always pushing for something kind of extreme, right? Fantastic working with the Fat Man. Um, I remember I, I called it up the very first time. I saw him at, at GDC and accepted the award for Wing Commander. And I'm like, i got to get a music guy. Um, I, I better call up someone who knows how to write music. So I called up the fat man. And I'm like, George, um, I, I want all the music in this game to sound like Danny Elfman. Um, and he, like, can you do that? He's like, sure, I, I can do that. And so about a week later, he sent me a track. And it sounded like Danny Elfman. But he sent me another track, which was the seventh guest theme. And he's like, Graham, two things. You can have the Danny Elfman track and we'll put that into the game, but never ask me to make a game that sounds like Danny Elfman. I'm going to make a game that sounds like the Fat Man. So, yeah. <laughs> George and I started to work together and uh, that's how we ended up with the Seventh Guest uh, um, soundtrack. And um, he would call up and we would talk and um, he, he, was, he, he would push me technically. He was like, we need to do this in X MIDI. We need to do this on this Roland MT32. You've got to go buy one of these things. You got to make it work through this um, expanded MIDI X MIDI format. So, um, I need Redbook audio on there for the end titles because I'm, I'm, I've got a singer coming in. I'm going to sing a song, and every time on the phone with him, I'm like, "Criminy, God, Redbook audio? How am I going to do that?" <laughs> but um, the first time I sat and watched the end credits to and, and skeletons in my closet played, it was that to me was a big, big moment. Um, but yeah, he made a tremendous difference. Yeah, I got a copy of a Seven Eleven, you know, sitting on my hard drive. You, you get a copy of that as a CD? <laughs> I have a few copies of that. Oh, probably signed. Okay, so a couple of little questions here. I was wondering. Uh, I saw that there were some plans to port it to the SNES CD. You know, I guess that eventually became the PlayStation. Uh, then there's also a CDI uh, version. So I'm just kind of wondering, what do you think of the CDI and uh, what happened with the uh, SNES uh, CD? Um. Well, the, there was never going to be a SNES CD. Um, there was a Sega CD, and um, the game was starting to do incredibly well. So Nintendo did not want um, Seventh Guest coming out on a Sega CD-ROM format. So they licensed Seventh Guest for their formats and then just did nothing with it. Um, um, so the, there was never any thought to bring Seventh Guest out for anything to do with Nintendo, but they did pay the license. Um, 
it did mean that Miyamoto came out to Oregon and he had a barbecue at my house. So that was awesome. Wow. Uh, that was that was pretty cool. Um, he couldn't speak any English at the time, but it was. I, I remember we were sitting on my balcony just looking at the Rogue Valley and having a barbecue and a beer. You didn't tell him about all the Zelda cartridges, huh? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> that was omitted. Um, well, we talked about... Um, he talked about why that Nintendo didn't like CD-ROM at the time, and that was that they were worried about children putting um, discs into it, 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 into a device, and they felt that a cartridge was the much easier device because it was always the right way up; it could always connect. And um, they thought a lot about the six-year-old changing cartridges, which was fantastic. Um, uh, that's actually what they thought about. Um, but uh, then the CDI version was—we were always excited about CDI. Because um, it, it, it could use real FMV, and, um, and Philips licensed Seventh Guest for that. And then they said, "Hey, can we have all the uh, source files to Seventh Guest and uh, all the art files?" And like, well, here's everything we have: uh, all the all these DAT backup tapes. And um, th 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 they were surprised that our backup system was not uh, more logical. Um, but that, um, but the game actually turned out fantastic on the CDI and. Um, I remember coming home one day, and here's, here's this box with a CDI thing inside it, and an MBEC thing, and and seventh guess, and I, I, it, it was exciting to see seventh guess on a different format. I probably sold a lot of CDI systems, I imagine. I remember going to what was the store, Fred Meyer, <laughs> and getting a CDI, you know, second CDI system, and um, and buying a whole bunch of cartridges. And um, for a while, it looked like that might take off as a platform, but um, unfortunately, it was it was not to be. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with part three of my interview with Mr. Graham Devine. I'm probably going to have at least one more, maybe two more episodes with him. And then it will be time for a new retrospective. Now remember guys, if you would like me to uh, review a particular game, uh, then you need to submit a short 10 to 15 second video telling me who you are, where you're from, and the name of the game. So that I can insert that at the beginning of the retrospective. I really enjoy that, and I think it's a, a way for you guys to get involved. So please send me your submission soon. I've only got three other ones uh, sitting on the hard drive right now, so there's plenty of opportunities to get your game in there. I want to mention, too, that if you'd like to own a copy of The Seventh Guest and The Eleventh Hour, you can go to GOG, and they are offering both, $10 each. I will have a special link, though, in the show notes that will uh, send you to my affiliate link. It doesn't cost you anything extra, but a small percentage of the purchase will go to support Match Hat. So just look for that in the show notes. I'll make sure that it's prominent, and you'll be able to get the game that way. If you want to make a, a donation to Match Hat, you just go to armchairarcade.com. Look for the link in the top right corner of the page. Any uh, size donation is fine and welcome. I actually had some uh, subscriptions drop off re recently, so if you've uh, been waiting to make a donation, now is a very good time uh, to do that. Now what about that ale of the week? This week I have a little number called Lost Trout. Uh, this is a brown ale brewed by the uh, 3rd Street Brew House right up the road in uh, Cold Spring, Minnesota. I've been meaning to visit this uh, brew house uh, for a while. Hopefully be able to do that soon and put some pictures up for you guys. Uh, really good uh, uh, ales from these guys. I've been impressed so far. Uh, it says alcohol 4.9%, so relatively weak. Maybe a a uh, little about about as much as a Budweiser, I guess, so uh, shouldn't be too strong. Anyway, let's get it open and see what the lost trout is all about. All right, so I'm here with the missing trout ale, and judging by the smell of this, I think I know what happened to that missing fish. But anyway, let's give it a taste. Mm. Oh no, that is really, really smooth. Like a Yoohoo chocolate soldier. Uh, very chocolatey coffee flavors here. Uh, nutty kind of flavors. Cocoa, if you will. Um, almost like chocolate milk, to be honest. Very smooth. I can't tell. I couldn't uh, tell you that there's any alcohol in this at all, actually. Uh, just a really uh, smooth, refreshing uh, drink here. Highly uh, recommend this, especially if you don't like a, a stronger ale. Uh, why don't we go three out of five uh, drinking horns on this. Uh, missing Trout, I definitely recommend this, uh, to, especially to people who like 
uh, Guinness or some of the darker ales, but not anything with too much of an alcoholic flavor to it. All right, what about that quotation? All right, so the quotation for this week comes from one of the masters of horror, Mr. Stephen King. And it goes something like this. Talent is as common as table salt. What separates the talented individual from the successful one is a lot of hard work. See you guys next week. When do you think maybe he should be taken to a doctor? As soon as possible. As soon as possible. <laughs>